This looks great. It's a beautiful plaque. And this looks good on you, too. It's a, when you do something right, yeah. I've been the most flexible. Ooh. Sorry, we're on. If I can have everybody's attention, Council. I just want to begin the meeting by uh, recognizing that uh, Councillor Hollingsworth and Councillor Dufour are at uh, the Roma conference, so they're not with us today. I just flew in from that. And I want to apologize to the good folks from Bonsu that I don't have my Bonsu sweater with me. I got off the plane and came straight here and didn't stop at home first. I also want to recognize that Paul, Councillor Paul Christian is not with us tonight because he's recently lost his sister. So our deepest and sincerest condolences to him and his family. And so we are ready to go and uh, I want to thank our media and broadcasting partners for reporting on and broadcasting our meeting and ask uh, the deputy clerk to call the meeting to order. Under agenda item one, adoption of minutes, a motion by councillors Vizzo Allen and Gurry, resolved that the minutes of the regular council meeting of 2020-01-06 be approved. Carried. Under agenda item three, declarations of pecuniary interest, councillor Hilsinger has declared a conflict with respect to item 8.2, economic development fund, Algoma University and Sioux College, as she empl is employed by the college. Councillor Shoemaker has declared a conflict with respect to consent item 6.9, Huron Street Pump Station, and associated bylaw 2020-19, as the contractor is a client of the firm. Councillor Shoemaker has declared a conflict with respect to bylaws 2020-30, 2020-31, and 2020-32, all related to 22 McDonald Avenue, as the developers are clients of the law firm. Councillor Shoemaker? Yes, one I missed, um, Mr. Mayor, is the planning item agenda on East Balfour. Okay. As I was became aware today that... Uh, so that's 7.3.1, nope, 7.7.1, 7.7.2. So 7.7.2 7.7.2 as the developer is a client of my law firm. 7.7.2, the proponent is a client of the Shoemaker's law firm, Council Shoemaker's law firm. Okay. Anything else, Council? Seeing none. Under agenda item four, a motion by Councillors Vezo Allen and Scott resolved that the agenda for 2020-01-20 City Council meeting as presented be approved. All in favor. Motion's carried. We're moving to proclamations and delegations. And under agenda item 5.1, the Community Development Award is being presented to the Machine Shop, 83 Huron Street. And I'll just read the resolution. Resolved that the report of the junior planner dated 2020-01-20 concerning the 2019 Community Development Award be received and that council present the 2019 Community Development Award to the Machine Shop located at 83 Huron Street. I have a bit of... Uh... A background to read before we present the award that the award is being presented uh, to the machine shop specifically to mr tony porco who is here with us tonight with uh, some members of his team and his family we welcome them to council in 1998 city council initiated a community development award program the purpose of the award program is to recognize significant achievement and community development highlight successful development ideas that others can use and inspire other projects to meet the standards set by successful projects. On behalf of the City of St. Marie and the Planning Advisory Committee, I'd like to congratulate the recipient of the 2019 Community Development Award, The Machine Shop, built in 1899 for the Sault Ste. Marie Pulp and Paper Company, founded by Francis H. Clerg. The Machine Shop was praised for utilizing some of the most significant Romanesque revival landmarks of industrial architecture in Canada. The machine shop has changed hands many times over the course of its 120 years. After Clerg's business empire collapsed in 1903, the machine shop was closed until the paper mill was transferred to the Lake Superior Paper Company in 1911. In 1920, it was purchased by the Abitibi Power and Paper Company, which ran the mill until it was sold to Dan Alexander in 1984. It was renamed the mill as St. Mary's Paper, and it was used by the company until it closed in 2011. 
After that time, it was acquired by Riverside uh, Rivers Edge Developments and then the SIS Group. And it has been revitalized and repurposed into a space that features restaurants, a concert and events venue, and will soon become home to the new Agua Canyon train tour station. The facility is something for our community to be proud of. And I wanna recognize the efforts of Mr. Porco and his team. I wanna thank Mr. Porco for his many investments in our community. And I congratulate the machine shop on receiving the community development award. It is a tremendous site and you've done a tremendous job with it. Thank you. We also have Bob Burns, the chair of the Community Development Award Committee in attendance to help with the presentation. Box it up and deliver it to you. Yeah. So we actually have that vote. You have to vote on. I think we have to vote on it. We've already given it to him, so you got to vote. Yes. <laughs> Of Councillor Gardy in the affirmative for yeah okay. Close that vote. Okay. Uh, under agenda item 5.2, Sioux Symphony Orchestra, Dr. Lawrence Chong, President, is in attendance. Welcome to Council, Dr. Chong. Good evening, um, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Thank you for the opportunity this evening to represent one of the oldest long-standing cultural groups of Sault Ste. Marie, the Sioux Symphony Orchestra. I am tasked with telling Sioux Ste. Marie residents with a message about our recent challenges and our efforts in keeping the orchestra alive. As community leaders in Sioux Ste. Marie, you can understand how important a symphony is to the life of our community. A symphony anchors the fine arts in any community. It is vital to attracting and retaining professionals such as doctors and other investors to a community because it provides a regular program of uplifting, engaging, and intellectual entertainment. I do have some in interesting statistics that may interest you. And these statistics are courtesy of the Ontario Arts Council, right from their website. According to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, arts, culture, and heritage improved the ability of municip municipal governments to influence local economic development by attracting and retaining a skilled and talented workforce. 88% of Ontarians believe that if their community lost its arts activities, people living there would lose something of value. 97% of Ontarians agree that engaging children in arts is also important in their overall development. 90% of Ontarians agree that arts experiences help bring people from diverse backgrounds together as a community. And 86% of Ontarians believe that the arts help us express and define what it means to be Canadian. Needless to say, the arts in Sault Ste. Marie is not only important, but a symphony properly supported will be impactful in the growth and development of our community, as well as the long-term social and economic development. Unfortunately, the Sioux Symphony ambitious programming over the last 47 years, bringing Italians from across the region to share our stage has led to financial shortfalls when revenues have not covered costs. This has led to deficits as high as $50,000 at the end of the 2017 season. A new board of directors over the past two years has taken the reins in hand to lead the symphony out of financial difficulty. We are proud to announce you have recently regained our charitable status with Revenue Canada, and so are able to issue tax receipts for all contributors. We have also cut expenses by doing smaller concerts in churches, 
We also partnered with the Algoma District School Board, obtained free rent space for our office in exchange for school programs. And this has added, this had had the added benefit of limiting our telephone and internet costs. These steps are just one of many and redoubling our efforts to generate and revenue from our programs have allowed us to reduce our formerly stagnant operating line by almost 50% in almost two years. We continue to work to find ways of reducing costs and raising funds while providing quality performances in our, to our symphony patrons. However, all of these efforts have not yet been enough. And we must now ask our community to help us during the last weeks of 2019 when we were notified that our banking arrangements and our line of credit were in jeopardy based on some shortfalls back in 2014 before we, the new um, board members took over. And uh, the financial institution which we work with has made it difficult for us to manage our cash flow. And we are finding it difficult now to move forward that way. We must raise $25,000 in order to bridge the gap between in, during this un, untimely interruption. Symphony members have contributed several thousands already, and we are hopeful that we can get through this and continue the music. We have worked very hard in the past two years and to celebrate our proud victories. Um, this recent event has set us back, however, and the decision to reach out to the public has been a difficult one. In its 47 years of existence, to our knowledge, the symphony has never made before a plea to this council or to our city. We are heartened to have learned that a request of a supporter just before Christmas has given us hope and contribu contributions from continuing members watching uh, council tonight or telling their neighbors would lift our spirits enormously. We have two exciting spring concerts planned, one recognizing the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth, February 8th. Um, that's the time of our concert. And we'll also be sharing the stage with a renowned fiddler, um, from our town, Pierre Schreier, and his band on April 18th. The symphony exists because of volunteers. Only a handful of musicians receive any compensation for their hours that they invest in the symphony. They do it for the love of the music, and costs that we have to carry are, include sound, lighting, technicians, program printing, a few musicians with, local, with lo both local and traveling, and travel costs for those we bring in. The community's help would bring us so much joy and confidence that we are on the right track moving forward. And Hopefully, we'll be, be, be in the block. Uh, we look forward to celebrating a future symphony with you and hope that you will join us for our upcoming concerts in 2020. And thank you for uh, letting me speak tonight. I wish everyone a pleasant evening, and hopefully, we'll get another 47 years in our community. Well, thank you very much for your hard work and the hard work of the rest of the board of directors. Uh, it's, it's appreciated, and it's important. If somebody in the community who is watching this does want to reach out and support um, the symphony, how would they do that? Well, on our website, we have all of the information required to give donations on a one-time or monthly basis. Um, it's very easy to follow. Um, and with that, um, we can also accept volunteer help as well. Okay. They could communicate us, communicate us that way. And, uh, hope, and then right now, we've had um, some great response at our annual general meeting just about a week ago. And uh, I am now have stepped down as president. Our new president is here with us, Louis St. Pierre. And uh, he is a musician and uh, part of the orchestra for how long, Louis? 1993, and, uh, and we're very happy to have him on board. We also have Michael DeSanto, one of, uh, uh, I don't know if anyone knows of him, but he works at Algoma University, and he's brought in some great ideas from Fresh Blood, and we are excited with that as well. Great. We also have um, the, who is it that entered as well? From? Ed Turgeon as well has also stepped, to be, stepped up to be a board member, and we're just looking for more blood, more good blood, right? Not out for blood. And uh, we want to uh, help revitalize the, uh, the arts in the community. I mean, I don't know what the budget has been like in terms of Sault Ste. Marie contributing to the arts, um, but we have received generous donations from the city um, for many years, and uh, we look forward to that support as well. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much for your time. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night. So we have a question from Councillor Vezo uh, We'll see. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Chong. Um, have you reached out to the Community Development Corporation or other professionals that can assist um, with the restructuring plan, business plan, moving forward with your organization? No, we have not as yet. Um, we are um, actually, that's part of our plans since the AGM. Thank you. Okay, I would recommend that. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? Anything else? No, nothing else. Thank you, doctor. Have a good night.
Go ahead. Under agenda item 5.3, PUC Services, Inc. Affordability Trust, Robert Brewer, President and CEO is in attendance. Welcome to council, Mr. Brewer. Welcome to council in your new role, Katie. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much for, uh, for giving us the opportunity to present today on something that um, uh, we think has been a great benefit to Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, we hope we can make it into even more of a benefit and there's been a good success story, f story for uh, PUC. So we'll cover off uh, what's known as the Affordability Fund Trust Program, the AFT program. We'll cover off some stats we have, some community participation, and some success stories. So the, uh, the program was established by the Ontario government. They put $100 million into a fund to try to help um, people who normally don't qualify for um, low income subsidies. So it's the next level up. And uh, it was a program that was announced a couple years ago. Uh, they've actually had a difficult time province wide in terms of getting the funding out. Uh, but here in Sault Ste. Marie, we've had a, uh, a large amount of uptake. And I think we've been pretty good at promoting it through uh, various channels. And the results are that uh, you'll see we've got a disproportionate number of Sault Ste. Marie people who are benefiting from it. Eligibility requirements for AFT. Uh, level one customer, that's everybody who's not eligible for low income programs, receives uh, an in-home energy savings kit. Um, that's, you know, LED light bulbs, power bars, uh, instructions on how to help save, uh, save energy in the home. It's about a $260 value for everybody that signs up. A level two customer qualifies for free appliances. And so these are, there's no copay on these. These are completely free appliances that people get if they're eligible based on their uh, their income to energy uh, consumption uh, ratio, and they'll get Energy Star appliances to replace appliances in their home that aren't as energy efficient. Level three customers are those that have electrically heated homes that have a uh, more than 3% of their uh, at home or our take home pay um, is, a, uh, uh, is taken up by their energy uh, costs. And they're eligible to receive up to $13,000 in subsidy, which includes things like heat pumps, it includes insulation, and also will include appliances on top of that. Uh, so those are predominantly electrically heated homes. So here in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, we've had, uh, we have 33,000 customers, 30,000 of which are residential customers who would, who would be uh, eligible. Uh, 5,000 of those uh, are participating in the program at present. Uh, 2,289 qualified for a level one. We've had over 2,000 customers that have gotten free appliances here. Um, we have six, 616 customers that have already qualified for uh, heat pumps and uh, Energy Star appliances in combination. So you can see what the reductions in the bills are, but just, just a level one energy kit alone is almost $300 a year. Uh, level two is uh, $550 a year, and level three is almost $1,000 a year in energy savings. So the AFT has allocated over $5 million um, that has gone to local businesses. We've gotten a total of about $11 million in total contribution amount. And uh, that's uh, businesses like uh, S&T and Spadoni's that are giving out considerable numbers of uh, appliances here in town and installing heat pumps and insulation. Um, the program has now, was originally uh, set to expire at the end of March. Uh, it's now been extended up till the end of uh, 2020, so the end of December 2020. And our, th at present, we're signing between four and 500 people up a month. So it's been a, a huge success story recently. Um, and hopefully that benefit continues to grow here in Sault Ste. Marie. So how do we compare? So to date, the provincial AFT program uh, is at 60,000 people. Sault Ste. Marie makes up 8% of the uh, total amount that is signed up for the program. And of the $100, $100 million budget, Sault Ste. Marie has accounted for 11% of the total allocation to date. You compare that to our population, we're at about a half a percent. So right now we're swinging about 22 times our normal weight, which is fantastic. So, so before you go any farther, yeah. though, I, I think the gravity we shouldn't like just drive past the gravity of these numbers yeah. and we should just stop at them and just point to the fact that this is this helps our community the people who are our rate payers also helps the PUC but this is a testament to the great work that you and your staff have done and uh, we have utilities across the province that can access this program and as you've pointed out uh, you're accessing it to you know 20 times our essential per capita ability to access it. So that's, that's tremendous. So it, it, it really is. And I mean, it's something we're really proud of. I mean, as a, as a community partner, which is the way we see PUC, to be able to bring in 
uh, you know, 10 or $11 million into the community to help people uh, with new appliances that will continually help them save money uh, with energy kits for their home and with things like heat pumps. I mean, it's made an enormous difference in people's lives and it's something that uh, we at PC are very, very proud to be a part of. So the, the moral of today's story is we want to keep on doing this. So we're here today to get yeah. the message out this and hopefully we, 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 want, we haven't been successful enough. Yeah. So we're at 5,000, we'd love to get to 10,000. Yeah. Um, and we think there's at least that many that qualify here in the Sioux, so we're obviously uh, pushing as much as we can. So, And you mentioned uh, a PUC benefit. The benefit really, I mean, from, from PUC's perspective, for the most part, um, this is something that uh, comes into the community through PUC and we completely pass through. Um, you know, there's a little bit of administration in terms of people and things, but for the most part, this is something where we're, we're really trying to do a community benefit piece here, and we think we've been pretty successful at it. So, so what contributes to our success? So uh, since AFT began in 2018, our staff's been, pretty, been very dedicated to attending community events, promoting the AFT program. So you've seen us at uh, Moonlight Magic, you see us at Greyhound Games, and I'm very keen on uh, making customers aware of the program and the long-term solutions it provides. Uh, we've been at Bush Plane uh, days with uh, multiple sign-up sheets and LED giveaways, including light bulbs, keychain, flashlights, and nightlights. Uh, and we've, uh, in addition to promoting AFT at events, we promoted different gifts and giveaways as part of the marketing strategy. You can see that with a Visa gift card winner sponsored by AFT at Bush Plane days and a $500 bill credit for the Festival of Trees. So some success stories. This is uh, Marsha and Larry received a new dryer and upright freezer. Now they're able to uh, save on their hydro and they've been able to afford a matching energy efficient washer, uh, uh, matching energy efficient washer to the dryer that was provided by AFT. And they're two very energy uh, conscious uh, customers and they appreciated the simple process that AFT uh, offered. Uh, Joan received energy saving upgrades such as a dual unit heat pump. So those heat pumps are roughly about $13,000 by the time you install them. It's quite a significant benefit. And that's on her annual electricity bill that she's saving money and she increases her monthly food allowance. The affordability program made it affordable for her to live in her home without the worry of high uh, electricity bills. And through word of mouth, Albert and Joan received an Energy Star washer for free. And they were so, so uh, impressed with the program that they even encouraged their friends and family to sign up. So one of the things that we've done is uh, we've gotten a number of uh, feedback pieces from people who have uh, been through the program and uh, we've updated our recently, uh, recently updated the frequently asked questions form that you'll see on our website. Um, and we would encourage anybody that has any questions to either reach out to us through our customer care department or to go on our website to call the affordability fund um, and just to generally talk to other people that have uh, been through the program. Uh, it's quite a successful program for Sault Ste. Marie and as I mentioned, PUC is very proud to be a part of it. So I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Councillor Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Brewer. To be eligible, is it an income? Mm -hmm. it, it does, does the program go by the annual income of the household? Um, or if it's all electric baseboards, do they? I, I don't know. Yeah. If you can so, explain. So the, um, everybody, everybody qualifies for a level one. So uh, anybody who isn't on a, an already subsidized uh, electric uh, bill through, their, uh, through an income subsidy. So everybody would qualify for a level one. A level two customer, it's, a base, it's their ratio of their income to the amount that they spend on their hydro bill. So if you look at the net income in the house and you look at the amount of that net income that is going towards their hydro bill, based on that percentage, will determine whether they qualify for a level two or a level Okay, and f that's for level two and three? Yeah, level three, the requirement would be that they'd be electrically heated homes, which is where you see the high consumption that would allow for, for a level three. Um, and what they're trying to do in level threes is where people have baseboard heating, as an example, to try to come in with more energy efficient heat pumps mm -hmm. or with increasing the amount of insulation in the home in order to help them keep that bill down. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Nero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Mr. Brewer. Just uh, for clarification, the first point that, that you actually made in your presentation was that the program was established by the Ontario government and is funded through the provincial revenue. That's totally correct. 100% of this money flows through the PUC, but it's completely funded by the Ontario government. 
Yep, so uh, just prior to the last provincial election, there was $100 million set aside by the Wynn government into this program. Um, and so that money was set up in a, in a trust, which hence the Affordability Fund Trust. And those revenues are brought down from that as we have eligible customers that qualify. And we allocated a certain budget. And based on uh, where we've been, those budgets have been continually revised to meet the additional people that are coming on board. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your time today, Rob. Thank you, appreciate it. Under agenda item 5.4, Bon Sioux Winter Carnival, Jeannie White, President, Linda Crockford, Director and Volunteer Coordinator, and Tim Marsh, Board Member in Attendance. Welcome to Council. Thank you. Tim's staying over there. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. We're a few people short, uh, scheduling changes, so all of our board isn't in attendance with us tonight. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome the host of our carnival, Mr. Bonsu, to join us. Mr. Bonsu's here. Is he here? He is. Oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Council, Mr. Bonsu. Greetings, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. I'm proud to be here on behalf of the 57th Annual Edition of the Ontario Winter Carnival Bonsu. Along with our presenting sponsor, OLG, for 10 days we will welcome everyone to come out and enjoy the carnival. Many events such as breakfast, a super fire show, four concerts, and the OLG firework extravaganza, and so much more. From bond tots to senior events, there is something for all ages and all interests. We are very excited to return to our host site, the Machine Shop, and Bellevue Park for Polar Bear Swim Day. Many of you, I think, uh, have seen that over the years. I'm not sure if anybody has, has jumped in with us. <laughs> I will keep my hand down. <laughs> um, as well as our Tim Hortons opening ceremonies, there will be free hot chocolate, which is generously provided. There will be new events and reoccurring ones as well. Jeannie's gonna introduce a couple of new events that we have. Well, I'm pretty excited about uh, a couple of the new events. Well, all the events, but um, I'm not sure if anybody watched uh, the great Canadian uh, race where we had the teams competing in Sault Ste. Marie, or the amazing Canadian race, sorry. Um, the Community First, uh, Sue Curler, they are going to be putting on the event, the Croak and Curl, and basically it's life-size um, members playing, and they set the rink up in a circle, and it's like Croconole, but with curling and other teams against each other on one big, huge circle. So that's a very exciting winter uh, sport we've never had before, so we're happy with that. Um, we also have um, Makers North with us, uh, they are um, making with their 3D printers, um, Mr. Bon Su, uh, either keychains or uh, zipper pulls. So locally made, they're biodegradable within two years, unlike a water bottle. They're made uh, um, from corn, actually. And they uh, they're have an event as well. So that's just two of the, some of the newer events we're having, and we're, we're excited. I'm also happy to announce that once again this year, for Bonsu 2020, our souvenir Bonsu button and our carnival pass will remain at $8. It's a, really a great deal. Join us for the Ontario Winter Carnival Bonsu. It's the cure for all of our winter blues. Friday, January 31st, the Tim Hortons grand opening will begin at 5 p.m. I would like to thank the staff of the City of Sault Ste. Marie for your support. We could not do it without our, our wonderful sponsors. We honor our volunteers who help make it all work, and we'd, we'd like to thank everyone. Thank you for your time, and any program information can be available on our website, bonsu.on.ca. And we look forward to seeing you all January 31st. Come out and join us. It's the greatest snow on earth. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. I have a proclamation here for you. Whereas each year the residents of Sault Marie await the arrival of Mr. Bonsu in the Ontario Winter Carnival with great enthusiasm. And whereas many local individuals, groups, service clubs, and businesses organize and sponsor a variety of interesting events for everyone, especially families, throughout the 10 days of the carnival. And whereas in order for all citizens and visitors to fully enjoy and reflect the spirit of the carnival, they must be properly attired. 
and this year celebrates the 57th anniversary of this community winter festival. Now therefore I, Christian Province Annals Mayor of the City of Sault Ste. Marie, request that all citizens and visitors remove their ties and button their collars and wear a Bon Sioux souvenir during the period from January 31st to February 9th, 2020, which I now proclaim as Ontario Winter Carnival Bon Sioux season in the City of Sault Ste. Marie. Bon Sioux is for you, let it snow. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I think that brings us to the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Madam Clerk. Yes. Any matters in the consent agenda, Council? Council Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item 6.4, uh, the Jumpstart Accessibility Grant. Okay. 6.4. Through you to Mr. Lamming. Um, thanks for the report. Um, is the idea that Anna Marinelli Park will be revitalized in 2020 with or without the grant? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, yes, uh, we'll be revitalizing the, the, revitalizing the park regardless if the grant's successful or not, because we did receive the, the support and the letters attached from the soup kitchen where they have the $50,000. It'd just be the increased scope if we are successful. Uh, we will be looking in the neighborhood of up towards $100,000 uh, to apply for the grant and that if we were successful, that would bring the total project cost to $150,000, which would allow us to do more with respect to the surfacing, pathways, wayfinding, accessible equipment. So it just it would expand what we'd be able to do. No, that's great. Uh, and, and from the city's perspective, our allocation is through our, uh, our general budget for parks for the year. Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Shoemaker, yes, uh, Public Works in partnership with CDS are working together and they'd be through the Public Works labor that would do any installation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else on that matter? Nope. Any other matters, Councillor Shoemaker? Um, public information sessions for environmental assessments through you to Mr. Elliott. What, what item is that? Um, that, sorry, is 6.8. Uh, six, sorry, 6.8? 6, 6, 6.8. Okay, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Elliott, uh, this is, it sounds to me like a slight change in policy. Uh, from now on, we will be uh, conducting uh, public notices on um, Schedule A plus um, uh, environmental assessments, but not necessarily public information sessions, just a mailed out notice. Mr. Mayor, that, uh, to Councilor Toomaker, that's correct. Essentially, if we are making some sort of a substantive change to that linear infrastructure, then we would uh, do a public notice. Right. Um, I, th I think, at least from my perspective, Councillor Hilsinger and I brought this motion together, what we were hoping to see was a public information session. I realize that there's, there's the discretion to hold one, but I guess, you know, these are, these, you know, from an engineering perspective, the reduction of, of lanes or the loss of parking may not seem like a major change, but from a, a neighborhood perspective, I think it is to the residents in the area. So. Uh, certainly, I would um, be more comfortable if public information sessions were held, uh, or what you call public information centers, if these four uh, criteria were were being considered. Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, that uh, that's essentially what uh, what we would do <clears throat> if we just decided to do a public notice. Um, the 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 EA process uh, encourages us to gauge public interest. So if we put a notice out there and we haven't planned a public information center and we get some significant feedback from that, then we would say, well, let's hold a public information center. I think for most of the things, if we're removing parking, if we're adding uh, like something significant like moving parking, for example, I think it's fair to say that staff is going to say, let's hold an open house, especially based on past experience. Okay. No, that's good. I guess just if that's going to be the um, the case, do the time frames that you set out in here, and I'm just looking for them. It was a, a month before the proposed implementation. Does that give you enough time to make to have the public information session uh, between the period of the notice and the period of the proposed implementation? M Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, if we uh, if the notice uh, if the notice went out. Um, we would, uh, 
we would essentially decide if we're going to have a public open house and if we if we did that would delay the implementation okay. we wouldn't we wouldn't say we're doing something in a month and we're going to have a public information session the day before we we did it that would just delay implementation right right because I, I think this happened you know this happened last year the public notice went out without a public information session being held and it ended up delaying the implementation because council uh, insisted that a public information session be held so it's kind of getting ahead of the you know getting out in front of the situation instead of us having to deal with it when it <laughs> when it comes before us Councilor, it, but, I'm, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm satisfied if if the if the intent is to gauge public uh, public uh, 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 opinion opinion yes thank you the word escaped me to gauge public opinion and then to determine if an open house is required Councilor Vezuel well, different matter okay anybody else on 6.8 anything else Councilor Shoemaker two the Bellevue Dock uh, replacement Through you two, I'm guessing this is probably either Mr. Ver or Mr. Lamming. Okay, um, I've, I've heard reports from boaters. I don't, I don't boat, but uh, I've heard reports from boaters that the docks that are in Bellevue Marina, which was replaced last year, um, are a bit wobbly. They're a bit narrow. That just that there are some slight improvements that could be made to them uh, is and and that's from a handful of folks uh who who do the boat in the community the docks that are being proposed here to be put in at pine street marina are seems to me the same as the ones at the bellevue marina through you mr mayor to councillor shoemaker yes the the new the, the recommended proponent will be very similar to the solution that we have at bondar marina and uh so that the consideration has been taken into place with respect to the ones that were done previously at the Bellevue Marina. So with a little bit extra finger uh, width length and that to stabilize. And it did take some time for our boulders to get used to that type of dock versus the historical ones that have been in place. Okay. And, and so is the dock of, I, I, there were only two bids, uh, is the dock of superior quality to the other bid? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, the, the recommended proponent, we had a pre-established uh, matrix that was used in the resin material, and that is a, is, is a, is, is a spec that was met within the, within the bid, also, also being a lower price. Okay. Um, okay. But is it a, a better quality? Like, I mean, I, I get what you're saying. It's where you want to use resin. Mm -hmm. But is, you know, if there are complaints with the current one, uh, is is there a better system out there? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Shoemaker, the, the, the proponent's material that was recommended is a superior product. Okay. So the ones that we're getting are the superior product. That is correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Anybody else on 6.2? Councilor Bezo Allen, what number are you? Uh, what are you on? I am 6.6. 6. The Industrial Land, Industrial Land Acquisition. Yep. Go ahead. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. McConnell. The Wood Park Court in, um, in the report, there's 42 acres south um, that we currently own. Correct? That's adjacent to the property. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council of Rezoal, and that's correct. The city owns the property to the south of the property that we're recommending for purchase. So just to have some sort of uh, reference, the way the land could be used, um, how many facilities or you know variations or subdivisions could you see as like could it be three industries there could it be multi-use industry like that's sort of my question is how could this parcel of land be um, divided um, as far as a marketing perspective through you mr. mayor uh, one of the things that this gives us is a large consolidated piece of property that's fully serviced and zoned heavy industrial and also has rail access. Okay. So this is a somewhat rare piece of property uh, in any community. So uh, the recommendation to acquire the former Alimenta property gives us the ability to hopefully, uh, well, to provide uh, a suitable land for a single large industry. 
Now that does not prevent the city from going ahead and selling smaller blocks of property, but we do have smaller blocks of property elsewhere in the community, particularly on Yates Avenue, mm -hmm. and there are some privately held properties as well that are much smaller. So at this, at this point, the intent behind this is to give us a large block of property for a single major user. Now, would we still be responsible for putting in road infrastructure? The, the, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the road infrastructure as well as all of the services are already in place. So the road infrastructure would be suitable for one large in industrial use. We wouldn't have to put in any further roads? That's correct. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. Okay. And the $270,000 sale price um, that has there is a signed agreement to purchase is below the impact value? It is slightly below the impact value. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Anybody else in 6.6? Okay, seeing none. Do you have anything else, Councillor Vezuela? No, that's it. Councillor Gardy? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, 6.5. Five, the agreement with Her Majesty the Queen, um, the yep. work, um, 49th Field Regiment uh, looking to do some exercises. At Point of Shane, um, a couple of questions uh, through you, I guess, to Mr. Vair. Would that be you? Who would? I think Mr. Lamin would probably. Lamin, sorry, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Lamin. Mr. Lamin, um, has anything like this been done in the past, though, at Point of Shane, to the best of your memory? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gardy, I'm not aware of the regiment in the recent history. It could have been done past prior to my time. I could find that information and note and get that back to you. Sure. Um, and it's over the course of a few days, correct? I don't recall correctly. Through, but... through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gardy, yes, that's uh, January 31st to February 2nd. Now, would that be, would, would there be at least some presence of the 49th Field Regiment personnel there overnight as well? Do you have any idea if that would be a 24-hour overnight thing? Through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Gar, I believe it's mainly during the day, but uh, if you wanted to, that information, we could get that to you. Okay, I, I would like that information. And thirdly, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Lamming, um, whether you or anybody else can comment on, um, in terms of like noise and things out there at that time uh, of day, is it predominantly like snow, snowmobiles we're looking, we're looking at and vehicular traffic as opposed to there's no kind of, not live ammunition, but any kind of sort of not live ammunition, if you know what I'm saying. I don't know what the proper term is. But, yeah. through, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Gardy, we weren't advised of any live ammunition going off, but when I get the other information, I can confirm that for you. Okay, so, um, yeah, because th there's a couple of concerns of some residents out there. I think they it's in and around noise, and I just wanted to canvas those with you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, no problem. So, just, just one point. I mean, we might not have been advised of any live ammunition, but I, I'm assuming that there will be no live ammunition, and we're agreeing to something happening with no live ammunition. So, so it's not it's not satisfactory just not being advised of any. We should be clear that there is none. Yeah. Yeah, you need uh, Mr. Councillor Gardis. Yeah. I'm pretty sure within the report or the agreement, I saw that there's no live ammunition, but I was just searching for it. Empty. Yes, I was searching for a term that would be like just noise of ammunition, but not necessarily bullets hurling back and forth. There might be empty rounds. Sure. Yeah. That, that's something yeah. like that is what I'm there might be that Some kind of noise in that respect. I see that our city solicitor has confirmed that as part of the agreement there, so she might want to call me further. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Gowdy, just the point that you made, it is in the agreement that there will be no live am yeah. um, ammunition used. Okay. Thanks, everybody. That was my understanding. Okay, anybody else on 6.5? Seeing none. Uh, any other matters in the consent agenda? Madam Deputy Clerk, if you could read that motion, please. Uh, under item six, consent agenda, a motion by Councillors Vizzo Allen and Gardy, resolve that the items listed under date 2020-0120, agenda item six, consent agenda, be approved as recommended, save and accept agenda item 6.9. All in favor? Motion carried. So that would bring us to uh, the resolutions, I imagine, because we have to wait for 5.30 for the planning agenda. So that will bring us to 8.1. Under agenda item 8.1, Shadows of the Mind Film Festival, a motion by Councillors Vizzo Allen and Nero, 
whereas the Shadows of the Mind Film Festival runs from Saturday, February 22nd to Sunday, March 1st, 2020, and whereas the Shadows of the Mind Film Festival is a film festival that showcases films and other art forms for two purposes, to entertain and to educate. By attracting audiences through the entertainment value of film, the film festival uses select films and events to increase awareness and education on mental health and addiction issues, as well as other prevalent social topics as decided each year. And whereas the Shadows of the Mind Film Festival is a not-for-profit organization, and whereas the primary venue for the film festival is the Grand Theatre, and whereas on some days during the week, the film festival will have films and panel discussions all day long, and whereas many patrons of the film festival attend in the morning and stay for the entire day, having lunch and dinner in the downtown area. Now therefore, be it resolved that the two hour daily parking limit be waived at the Brock Albert parking lot to permit full parking from Monday, February 24th, 2020 to Friday, February 28th, 2020, all during the week of the Shadows of the Mind Film Festival. Okay, did uh, you want to speak to that resolution? either Council Bezuel or Council Nero? Just um, very briefly, um, this is something that we did last year as well and historically have done, and I think it's important to support um, the patrons um, that attend the festival. It is a volunteer-driven organization. They do a lot in terms of creating awareness on a lot of different issues that people have difficulty in understanding, and uh, it also just keeps people in the downtown area, which I think is really critical too. And I support the volunteers and the board of directors that put this festival together and happy to be able to bring forth this resolution. Councilor Nero, anything to add? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, the fact that this actually started some years ago, as Councilor has already noted, when that area was under Ward uh, 4. And this is an ongoing resolution and there were issues when people were parking there and leaving then coming back to movies and this makes it much easier for them to spend the day there yep. uh, spend their time downtown so. any other comments questions all in favor motion is carried so we have everybody's votes yeah uh just councillor bruni oh we're good yeah. okay Under agenda item 8.2, Economic Development Fund, Algoma University and Sioux College. A motion by Councillors Vezo Allen and Nero. Whereas our community plan, Future SSM, recognizes that Sioux College and Algoma University, our post-secondary institutions, are an integral part of our community's future and specifically identifies growing our post-secondary institutions as a community goal. And whereas our post-secondary institutions are critical to youth retention, labor force development, economic development, and therefore community development, and whereas the city should recognize, encourage, and support the efforts being made by our post-secondary institutions to meet community goals, keep our youth at home, develop our labor force, and improve our community. Now therefore, in recognition of the foregoing and to support their efforts, City Council will earmark and set aside 20% of the Economic Development Fund for the remainder of this Council term, therefore $100,000 in each of 2020, 2021, and 2022 to support projects at our post-secondary institutions that are consistent with and further the goals of our community plan and encourages both Sioux College and Algoma University to work with Deputy CAO Community Development and Enterprise Services and the future SSM team to develop projects or plans either individually or in conjunction with each other to apply for and access the earmarked funding. So I'd like to speak to this before I pass it over to Councillor Bezalel and Nero. I want to thank them for putting their names in this resolution. Uh, this resolution came from a couple places. Uh, one, it came from some time I spent with Dr. Common, who is here. I thank him for coming. And also the president of Ogoma University um, and discussions with her. Also discussions I've had with our deputy CEO, Mr. Ver and Travis Anderson from the Future Sioux St. Marie team. Uh, there's eight overarching goals in our community plan, and one of them focuses on supporting and growing our post-secondary education institutions. Um, and we, we talk about it, and we all recognize the importance of those institutions to our labor force and to our community. Uh, they're incredibly important institutions to our future. 
but we have no actual resources allocated uh, in the future St. Marie plan or you know, at the city to actually further any of those goals. And one of the things that we thought would be important is if we could uh, identify some resources that they could access if we come up with plans and projects that further our community goals. Uh, so I want to make it clear that this isn't uh, spending or giving this money to the college and university at this point. This is earmarking it and setting it aside and recognizing we will allocate that money to the college and the university, provided that uh, the city, the college and the university work together and come back and present some plans to council on how the money would be used. So it's a matter of, uh, of, of making the teamwork happen and getting people together, but those plans would still have to come back here uh, for our consideration and our approval. And it would have to be demonstrated how the, the plans are consistent with our community plan and how they further our economic development goals. I think there's a clear line between our labor force development and our economic development. We've heard from all of our employers about the need for uh, specific uh, labor development in our community. And who does that if not the college and the university? So uh, to me, I thought it was a really, uh, this was a really kind of responsible way, a financially responsible way of earmarking funds that we already have set aside that are already in the levy. Uh, to create some cooperation and collaboration between two of the key institutions in our city and the city itself. That to hopefully even further some of our community goals. And uh, I hope council would see uh, supporting the resolution. I don't think there's any risk in it. And I think it was a win-win-win and very positive for the community at large. <coughs> turn it over to Council of Allen if she has anything to add. And Council Nero, if you want to make any comment, you're welcome to. And then we'll open it up for any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. And to both my colleagues on council, people in the chambers and people watching. The EDF fund um, is net job creation is you know, one of the pillars which you look at wealth generation and diversifying our economy. So definitely supporting our post-secondary institutions is all about you know, building our knowledge-based economy which is something I, I firmly believe in. I have been an, an instructor at Sioux College. I worked at Algoma University from a development perspective and I'm also Algoma University graduate. Um, and it's not just what we're saying. If you take a look at the Conference Board of Canada, there's, there's data. For every dollar spent on post-secondary institution investment, the economic value of that, the return, is $1.36. So that's not coming from us or, or any of our institutions. That's you know, the Conference Board of Canada. That is, that is real data. The economy itself, nationally, $40 billion in generated income is from post-secondary institutions. And when you give to post-secondary institutions, it's all about them leveraging dollars as well. So there's a really interesting um, synergy between the University of Saskatchewan and the city of Saskatoon. They actually have a research junction. So it's a partnership between the city of Saskatoon, which has gone through a lot of building and a lot of really growing their knowledge-based industry in the past 20 plus years. And they are a very isolated community as sometimes we tend to um, you know, deal with as well. So it's not just a model that's, that we are providing or you know, in, initiating, it's something that exists. So I wholeheartedly support this um, resolution. I think it's something that we um, need to do and also by making that commitment to our institutions like Sioux College and Algonquin University, I have a cold, it helps them leverage other dollars because they can say our city supports us in this manner and that is a huge um, uh, benefit when you're going for a lot of the larger research grants and, and other capital grants within these institutions. So thank you very much. Casanera, did you have any comment? Just a brief one, Mr. Mayor. I'll certainly support the resolution and I just want to say that I believe that probably there wasn't a candidate that ever ran for municipal election that at one point didn't say that uh, post-secondary education were great economic drivers. So it's something that we should support. We've all said we should support. Uh, we all said that it should happen. So this is a way to make it happen. Any other questions, Councilor Shoemaker? Councilor Shoemaker, the Councilor Brody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've gone back and forth on this one a bunch uh, over the weekend um, <clears throat> on whether or not I, what I've come to the determination of is that I'm very supportive of our 
post-secondary institutions. As Councilor Nero said, everybody talks about it uh, during campaigns. We all talk about it uh, uh, in the chamber. Post-secondary institutions are critical to the economic development of our community. We see that in communities like uh, London, like Guelph, that have vital uh, and thriving post-secondary institutions. Uh, Sioux College is doing great. Algoma U seems to be on a upward uh, trend after a couple of difficult years. My difficulty with this resolution <coughs> is um, just the, the procedure of it, which is that we're earmarking money for them to bring us back projects. Um, at, at what point we'll determine whether or not they qualify for the for the uh, metric set out in our our uh, or the criteria set out in our economic development fund. If we they know, which they, they do, because Dr. Commons here, and uh, I'm sure uh, uh, President uh, Vesna is watching um, at home. If, if they know the money's available, they will certainly come up with a way that uh, they are able to use it. I supported Algoma U when their request came to us uh, through the Economic Development Fund maybe six months ago for their, uh, for their uh, campus revitalization. And I would certainly be open to supporting future proposals that come forward. Really, it's a, it's a procedural issue that I think uh, gives me some hesitation with this, which is that we're telling them the money's available, come to us with a project uh, that, that will use up the funding. If they came to us with a project, there's a high probability I'd support the funding. Um, and, and I think that's the way it needs to come about, rather than us saying, we're gonna set this money aside and come to us when you've got a reason to use it, they should come to us and ask us to use uh, uh, our economic development fund when they uh, feel there is a need uh, on their behalf to put a project forward. I think you'll get better quality of projects if they've determined that it's a priority for them uh, that they want to put forward rather than if we go to them and ask them to determine projects uh, that they could use this funding for. I, I think you'll get the best project if you do it the other way procedurally than if you, if you do it this way. So I am uh, not going to support this uh, resolution, though I do um, uh, echo the comments of, of Councillor Nero, Councillor Bezoel, and that our post-secondary institutions are vital. I'll, I'll, uh, Councillor Bezoel said she's an Algoma U alumni. I'll, I'm an Algoma U alumni as well, and I was up until recently on the board of Sioux College. My brother graduated, or was on the board of Algoma U. My wife went to Sioux College, my dad went to Sioux College, my sister went to Algoma U. So I've got a long history, uh, a familial history of supporting both institutions, and uh, will continue to do so. Uh, it's just the, the procedural uh, way this, uh, this proposes to be implemented that I have some difficulty with. Councilor Bruni. Did you just comment, <coughs> Mr. Mayor? First of all, I just want to state that I have supported our post-secondary institutions and I continue to support their efforts and their important role in our community. But I am finding it difficult, as Councillor Shoemaker has stated, to support this resolution. In the past, we have provided, and I supported the following, Agoma University and Sioux College received over a million dollars each to, to assist with the strategic growth. Agoma <coughs> University received 400000 uh, for their School of Business expansion, and they also continue to receive $40,000 from the city and its grants to outside aid agencies. The funding uh, provides the $20,000 for scholarships and $20,000 to assist with recruitment initiatives. And Sioux College received $400,000 for their IE project. In total, we've provided over $2.8 million to our post-secondary institutions, and I voted uh, every time for the money to be processed to these uh, secondary in institutions. But the reason that, that I'm, I'm having difficulty supporting this, and it's twofold. First of all, I, I've checked their financial statements, and both institutions continue to be well-funded through the provincial and federal government. Their tuition revenue is stable, and it's growing at a healthy clip. And both institutions posted surpluses in most recent fiscal year, $10.7 million in excess of revenue over expenses at Sioux College and $1.2 million 
excess of revenue over expenses from the operations uh, in the case of Agoma University. So considering our past generosity to these institutions and the healthy state of their current financial situation, um, the ongoing revenue service delivery cha uh, challenges we are facing as a municipality. I prefer that the college and the university will come forward uh, to council uh, instead of having council earmarking the money for the next three years. I think every time that, that they have something that they can come forward and then we can look at our EDF funding and provide them money if it's uh, required. But to to just say we're going to earmark the next three years, the 20%, um, I will vote against it. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilor Gardy. I, uh, as I read the motion, um, and I'll ask you, uh, Councillor Vizuelan, if I can, or for someone else to clarify uh, for me, but I see to, uh, at the end there, to develop projects or plans, either individually or in conjunction, correct? Not necessarily a project, but it could be a plan or plans, correct? That's correct. Okay. So, the, I, I get pretty passionate when it comes to talking about uh, colleges and universities and and uh, their impact on communities. And I do that because I really think that over the course of 20 or 25 years, this community uh, was a, kind of asleep at the switch, if you will, <laughs> put too much of their eggs in one or two baskets. And when cities like St. Catharines and Guelph and Waterloo and to a certain extent Sudbury and Thunder Bay were pursuing university charters and those communities were supporting their universities, um, we weren't to the degree that we should have. The universities, the university or uh, Sioux College. And I think if anybody considers where our community is in terms of its economic development and diversification compared to say um, a, few of that, a few that I mentioned, um, the, the benefits uh, go, without, go without saying. I think if we were to ask Dr. Common if um, he could develop along with, uh, alongside or with uh, the university uh, and President Vezina, uh, a plan where they could use $100,000 a year, I don't think that would be very difficult at all. Um, as a mid-sized city, I think Sault Ste. Marie has to employ every tool in its toolbox to compete in a global knowledge economy. Um, I, I would refer my two councillor colleagues to my left, along with anybody who's interested in looking at a report uh, from Evergreen, May 2017, Leveraging Ontario's Urban Potential Mid-Sized mid Cities Research Series. I read it over the weekend, um, uh, and I couldn't believe to I couldn't believe um, the impacts that uh, colleges and universities have. I just think that um, it's vital, and um, we need to develop our labor market. But we also need to what we also need to do is develop a coherent strategy. We need to identify our local strengths. We need to coordinate that infrastructure uh, that we have with it, and. Uh, the two post-secondary institutions would go a very long way in doing that, and we need to do it much better than we have in the past. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Scott, did you have anything to add before we vote? I still want to leave you out. Uh, sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor, since everyone else has spoken. Um, I, I also went back and forth over this on the weekend, and I think uh, a lot of my, my feelings and my sentiments were actually already shared by both Councillor Shoemaker and Councillor Bruni. Um, I, I would gladly support anything that they bring to us, I just think that I'm hung up on the procedural aspect of it. So before we vote, I just want to address the procedural aspect because, I mean, I thought a lot about that before we did it. And, and this, the simple idea, and I think maybe the difference of opinion, and th this isn't about waiting for something to happen or waiting for something to come to us. This is about trying to make something happen. And our community plan specifically addresses supporting our post-secondary ed education institutes, and we have to show them that we do. And uh, we've had those discussions, and I think we have to try and make something happen. We have to try and make something happen in our community at this time, and I think this is a pretty modest and uh, financially responsible way to do it because the fund's there and it's in the levy. 
Um, so we, we can vote on the matter. Uh, everybody's had a chance to speak on it. So we have the resolution. The resolution's been read. All in favor? Opposed? So the motion's carried. Which brings us to the planning agenda. Yeah, we'll come back to that. We've got to get to planning. It's 5.30. So thank you for coming, Dr. Kalman. Uh, the motion's passed, and uh, Tom and Travis will follow up. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Council. Yeah. Okay, so Madam Clerk, if we can go to the planning agenda, please. 7.1. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, 7.3. No? 7.1. 7.1. We did 7.3 points. <laughs> okay. Under agenda item 7.7.1, 7 A2119 Z, 139 White Oak Drive West, a motion by Councillors Vezo Allen and Gardy, resolved that the report of the planner dated 2020 0120 concerning rezoning application A2119 Z be received and that City Council approve the application as follows. One, amend zoning bylaw 2015-150 by rezoning the single detached residential zone R2 portion of the property to medium density residential zone R4.S with the following special exemptions. Or, <coughs> sorry. One, permit two parking spaces in the required front yard. Two, permit the development of an apartment building and a multiple attached building consisting of no more than 20 units in total and no higher than one story. And two, designate the subject property as an area of site plan control pursuant to section 41 of the Planning Act, and that the legal department be directed to prepare the necessary bylaw to effect this approval. Before uh, you speak, Mr. Pascuzzi, we're just gonna pass it on to Mr. McConnell here to just give uh, the folks watching at home a general a sense of what this application is all about. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this property is uh, probably much better known as the former St. Anne School site on White Oak Drive. Uh, as the uh, Deputy City Clerk mentioned, there is a request to approve tonight uh, converting it to a 16-unit apartment building uh, within the existing building. Uh, and in addition, an, uh, there, the applicant is proposing an additional four townhouse units. Uh, it is recommended for approval. The applicant did hold a neighborhood meeting and there were 10 of the, of the uh, uh, neighbors in attendance. I think it's fair to say that it was, the neighbors were generally supportive of the application. And Mr. Pascuzzi is in attendance tonight should council have any questions. Welcome to council, Mr. Pascuzzi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. I know I wasn't originally <laughs> going to be speaking. This was a last minute addition, but uh, the owners of the property who I acted for when they purchase the property, the representatives of the BDI holding are here. So if there's any technical questions of council, I'll direct it to them. Um, I'll keep my comments brief, uh, which is unusual by my reputation, but I'll do my best. Um, I think the, the report by planning is pretty detailed and pretty well hits on all the major points uh, that we think are relevant. Um, at the end of the day, I always take the approach with clients with development that um, well, sometimes rezonings can become a bit of a, uh, you know, uh, an emotional issue or a political issue for people. I think the, the important thing to keep in mind, ultimately, it is a planning exercise. And at the end of the day, the question really for council on any rezoning is whether or not the, uh, the rezoning is, uh, makes good planning sense. So in order to make that determination, I would suggest you have to turn to your planning documents, so your official plan and ultimately your provincial policy statements. And without going into detail, because again, I'm sure you've all read the report, I think it's pretty clear that this proposal is both in keeping with uh, the official plan for the city, as well as uh, provincial policy statements. And just for the benefit of, if there's any members of the public or neighborhood people in attendance tonight, what I mean by that is essentially uh, one of the things that the province has identified as part of, I guess, you would say sort of a, uh, making a positive or progressive uh, environmental impact on, on all communities is trying to redevelop existing land. So in other words, before we pave over new greenfield, uh, what can we do to redevelop existing land? So this redevelopment is in keeping, I would suggest, with the character of the neighborhood. It's a residential development. It's a relatively modest number of total units. 
Um, as was as indicated in the report, the plan that the uh, my client has shared with the members of the neighborhood and the planning department uh, is, I think, an aesthetically very pleasing development uh, and will blend into the neighborhood as opposed to take away the neighborhood uh, for things such as, uh, you know, comments were raised about uh, concern about view of, uh, of the rest of the city from that area. Um, certainly in terms of things like traffic and congestion, you know, things that legitimately people are concerned about in the neighborhood are adequately addressed. In fact, as uh, indicated in the planning report, really traffic and those type of issues will be actually uh, relatively minimal compared to what uh, what occurs when it was St. Anne's school, what occurs daily at a, at a school. I know that from picking up my my son, it's a bit of a combat zone sometimes uh, at school uh, at parts uh, different times of the day. So I think the development fits nicely into the neighborhood. Um, of course, when you get into nitty gritty details about buffering and that sort of thing, uh, the proponents are in full agreement with planning division that this is definitely a project that should be and will be subject to site plan control. And obviously before the project can go ahead, uh, site plan control will have to be implemented, site plan agreement, uh, the appropriate drawings, uh, which will lead to the appropriate uh, uh, permit process. So as council well knows, and for again, the reassurance of people in the neighborhood, um, even with the uh, approval of the rezoning, there will still be hoops that my client will have to jump through to ensure that the project uh, meets all the standards uh, that the city has set in its uh, building code and its official plan, et cetera. So uh, I think the project, uh, if I can uh, uh, dare use this phrase, is, uh, is non-controversial, fits well into the neighborhood, uh, and it meets a demand that exists in the community. Um, you know, with some of these projects uh, and some of the other ones you see in town, there's a reason that all these projects are coming out at this time. I mean, neighborhood schools are really valuable property uh, in neighborhoods, and to see them go into disarray and disrepair is actually kind of sad. So to see you know, proponents and developers come forward to, uh, uh, to make, uh, I think, appropriate use of the property uh, is really, I think, a, a positive thing for the, uh, for the community. And, uh, you know, there's always a debate between, um, uh, you know, financial assisted housing or social housing, it's commonly referred to. Uh, this will be market rent uh, housing because uh, there's a need for that in the community. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, so, you know, so we have needs, I think, for various type of housing opportunities from single family to uh, you know, multi, multiplex and apartments. So this isn't going to solve all Sault Ste. Marie's housing issues, but it'll be, it'll be another development towards uh, meeting at least one area of, uh, of uh, need in the community, which in my daily practice, uh, I see all the time, you know, uh, people that are in neighborhoods like where I live, the pea patch, they're selling their house, they're getting older, they're looking for a nice apartment to move into. And uh, it's not not easy to find all the time. So I think this will, you know, this is this is just one more project towards uh, towards meeting that need. And I hope uh, we hope council will uh, will support this uh, application. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Do we have anybody else here that's here to speak in favor of the application? Seeing none. Uh, anybody here to speak in opposition to the application? I see none. I have a list of questions. Council Bruni, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, I guess to Mr. McConnell, I'll direct the questions to and then. Um, so, um, so they did mention the height of the addition, which is, a, is it approximately 8 to 10 feet higher than what the existing building is right now? look to the building as opposed to the institutional look that it now has. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen that done at several other schools in town and it's uh, been very successful. Okay. Uh, regarding the parking, I noticed there's a proposed addition. Um, the parking will be in front of the addition, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, If I, Mr. Mayor, if I could continue on that point with regards to the parking. 
The, the overall, at the end of the day, they're taking a lot of paved space out of this development and replacing it with landscaping. So the actual paved area will be much less than it, than it is there at the moment. And as a result, the overall appearance of the, of the site should improve considerably. Okay. And your opinion is there'll be less traffic now than when the school was in operation. Would that be uh, Mr. Correct? Mayor, that's correct. We anticipate significantly less traffic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I guess to the developers or to the legal representation, would there be a start date for this? And would there be possibly a completion date approximately? Sure, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to my client for that. This is uh, Sean Spur, he's one of, the, one of the directors of the corporation. Hello, uh, we'd like to start uh, as early as this spring 2020, depending on uh, this process, if this goes through and how quickly we can you know, work with site plan in order to uh, get approval on development. And we anticipate it taking approximately uh, between a year and a half and two years to complete. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess to Mr. Spur, would this be something basically like the St. Teresa School being converted to uh, yes. apartments? Yeah, very similar to what yeah. has been done at St. Teresa's on Estelle Street. <laughs> Thank you. I fully support this uh, development. I think it's important, and it's uh, it's taken over an old school that's been abandoned for I don't know how many years now, and uh, move forward. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A question through you to Mr. Pascuzzi. What's your definition of brief? <laughs> <laughs> well, just, I <laughs> just joking. You, 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 I, I thought. Uh, well, I thought by my standards that. <laughs> You're but right, as you know, your, brief is like the term reasonable. <laughs> yes, yes, you're It's right. open to many interpretations. When you consider they're paying them by the hour, you did pretty good. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, thought I can stay were, all night if you want. It's I thought they were paying them by the word. <laughs> um, I, I had comments, uh, which are that it's great to see uh, uh, young developers in the community uh, taking on projects like this. So uh, we've seen success uh, with projects like this at Bayview, at St. Teresa's, and now at uh, at St. Anne. I'm, I'm confident we will see success at St. Anne's. I support the, the proposal, and uh, hopefully it uh, goes smoothly for you guys. Thank you. Councilor Nero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, too, support the, uh, the rezoning application. I applaud the developers on, on the plan here. Uh, Councilor Bruni and myself had the opportunity to meet with them at one of the units, a couple of units that they just finished on a previous rezoning application that we dealt with. And the units are, are really nice. They're, it's good work. It's a very appropriate size for what we need out there. And I think more importantly, uh, came up tonight from, from a couple of councillors who are dealing with a vacant school that has been causing problems for over a year now. And this is the best plan for these kinds of yeah. empty spaces. So uh, good luck. Uh, I fully support this application. Councillor Bezo Allen. Through you, Mr. Mayor, probably to Mr. McConnell um, and putting on my accessibility committee hat. Um, of the 20 proposed units, are any of them going to be accessible for people that have physical um, impairments? Uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Rezzo Allen, the, uh, site, the City Site Plan Advisory Committee, which is a subgroup of the Accessibility Committee, will be given an opportunity while they have commented on this. Um, with regards to making the units inside the building accessible, they will be to the extent as required by the building code. So there will be several units that will have to meet the accessibility provisions of the building code. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Mr. Biscuzzi, thank you for your keep, very capable presentation to the developers. Uh, thank you for undertaking this initiative. I think it's fantastic. Uh, these vacant schools are no good to anybody vacant. And I think it's great to see some young people have some get up and go and trying to, to repurpose them. So I uncategorically support the, the, the application. We'll call the vote. All in favor? Pass unanimously. Thank great. you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Mayor Council. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. That brings us to 7.7.2. Are you staying for this one too, Ben? No, I'm, I think <laughs> I'm done. Under agenda item 7.7.2, A22, 
19 Z 227 231 235 239 and 243 East Balfour Street a motion by councillors Vezo Allen and Scott resolved that the report of the junior planner dated 2020 0120 concerning rezoning application A2219 Z be received and the council approve the application by rezoning the subject property from single detached residential zone R2 to low density residential zone R3 with special exception to one, reduce the required interior side yard for the future middle lot from three meters to 1.2 meters. And two, reduce the required interior side yard for the future easterly lot from three meters to 1.2 meters. Further, that council deem the subject property as subject to site plan control pursuant to section 41 of the Planning Act and that the legal department be directed to prepare the necessary bylaw to effect this approval. So Mr. McConnell, we're gonna start with you again, if you can just give us a brief summary of this project. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the subject property is on the south side of East Balfour Street uh, at the intersection of Gooley Avenue. So it's on the east side of Gooley Avenue on the south side of East Balfour. The applic... <laughs> The applicant is requesting approval for nine townhouse units on the property. Uh, there was a neighborhood meeting I was not able to attend, but I, uh, my staff did, and I was told there were two residents that appeared at the neighborhood meeting and that they also appeared to be generally supportive of the application. Uh, both the applicant, uh, uh, Ms. Hurley and Paul DeClerc, their engineer, are in attendance tonight uh, should council have any questions. So, at the microphone, if you can just introduce yourself for the record, please. Yes, uh, Paul DeClerc from Narkway Engineering. Uh, on behalf of Mr. Hurley, who was uh, unable to attend tonight, I just uh, want to uh, address uh, the Mayor and Council in regards to uh, this development. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, we're just going to add that the uh, development seems to suit well with the law of the neighborhood. There is some multifamily uh, in close proximity. Um, so it seems to lend well in that regard. What's being proposed is uh, two bedroom townhouse type units, uh, some of which uh, will be accessible uh, for barrier free as well. Uh, That's kind of the, a bit of the target uh, population that uh, uh, the developer wants to address. Do you have anything else to add with respect to the application? Uh, I think it's fairly well covered in, uh, in, pl in the planning report. Is there anybody else present that's here to speak in favor of the application? Is there anybody here present that is here to speak in opposition to the application? Seeing nobody else to speak in favor of it or nobody else in opposition to it. Council, do you have any questions for planning staff or the applicants? Seeing none, we can uh, call a vote on the resolution. All in favor? The resolution carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings us, Madam Clerk, back down to resolutions. And we have the 8.3, which is the warming shelter. Under agenda item 8.3, warming shelters, a motion by Councillors Shoemaker and Hillsinger. Whereas in 2018, the city of Sault Ste. Marie developed a cold weather warming shelter plan. And whereas in the last days of 2019 and the first days of 2020, the city of Sault Ste. Marie experienced extreme weather that led to extended loss of power. And whereas during the extended power loss, the temperatures were relatively mild resulting in the cold weather warming shelter plan not being triggered. And whereas staff at the City of St. Marie recognized the need for a warming shelter despite the relatively mild weather, and in partnership with the Water Tower Inn, provided a space for community residents to find warmth. And whereas the situation experienced in the last days of 2019 and the first days of 2020 identified the need for an update to the City of St. Marie's warming shelter plan, now, therefore, be it resolved that staff review the warming shelter plan currently in place and recommend the necessary adjustments based on the needs of the community that have become evident as a result of recent events. Councillor Shoemaker. 
Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I think the uh, resolution itself is pretty self-explanatory, but uh, really I think kudos goes to staff for <clears throat> recognizing the need uh, for a shelter uh, during, the, during the power outage that happened uh, right at the end of the year this year, or sorry, the end of the year in 2019 and uh, for, for actioning uh, the opening of a, a shelter uh, at the Water Tower Inn. So um, obviously uh, it's just prompted uh, the question, when does our plan get triggered? Uh, and hopefully uh, staff will take the lessons they learned from uh, recent uh, events and um, come back with uh, recommendations on improving our current policy. I'd also ask uh, while they're looking at it, if they would consider lowering the threshold at which the plan gets triggered. It currently gets triggered at minus 40. I think that's plenty cold. And minus 30 is plenty cold. So uh, I would uh, ask that they ponder that issue as well. I'm just going to ask the CEO to speak to the matter. He can uh, give you his perspective on, on maybe what occurred and what we're, how we're managing it. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker and the rest of Council. <clears throat> Certainly with the most recent event, anytime we have an event where we're needing to uh, deal with these matters, we do uh, review things and we already are reviewing uh, and we'll bring a report further to council. Each uh, event that happens has its own uh, variables uh, to it, uh, whether it's temperature, in this case it was uh, the absence of power for uh, many people. I would just like to uh, certainly uh, let the community know and let council know that uh, those persons who we could identify as being vulnerable uh, to the situation were dealt with right away. They didn't need to wait for the opening of a warming center. Uh, the PUC advised the Red Cross and uh, the Red Cross were deployed on an individual basis. It was, uh, though, as the power outage extended uh, into the uh, next days and subsequent days that we decided it was uh, right to open a, a warming uh, center so that people could come to either get warm or have uh, access to uh, running water and that so that uh, they could have a shower and do those things. Okay, any other comments or questions on the resolution? Councilor Gardy. Um, I'm formulating this as, as this uh, CA was speaking, but I think Councillor Shoemaker hits on a decent point when he, he, he's speaking of um, the threshold. You had said minus 40 is pretty darn cold, so it's minus 30. How, how, would, how does this reflect um, this in, uh, a policy, if any, that we have in this summer? So in the summer, if it's too hot, do we have cooling shelters? Yes? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gardy, yes, we do anticipate those types of situations as well. So have we, over the course of, through you, sorry, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Mr. White, CAO White, would you happen to know um, roughly over the course of the last few years how, 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 how many times we had to action um, like a co cooling shelters? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Gardy, I'm not sure we've had to uh, initiate uh, those plans, uh, okay. certainly in the last few years. Right. How often over the last few years have we had to exercise warming shelters? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gardy, uh, I'm not sure we've had to initiate it. Uh, the way the uh, plan currently reads is that we inform uh, our community partners, especially those dealing with the, the more vulnerable uh, right. areas of our population to make sure they uh, are uh, intending to uh, watch out for their own clientele. Um, certainly, I think we'll uh, canvas the issue in a report that we bring back okay. to Okay, I, I appreciate that. I like Councillor Shoemaker, and I think this is where Councillor Shoemaker is going. I think as a community, we need to kind of uh, lead to a certain degree in this effort, and uh, whatever efforts uh, you uh, pursue, Mr. Shoemaker, you'll have my support on that. Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Carried. So that brings us to bylaws. Am I correct, Madam Clerk? Is that yes. to be clear? So um, we have some bylaws we have to separate out. Yes.
Under agenda item 11, consideration and passing of bylaws, a motion by councillors Vizzo Allen and Scott resolved that all bylaws under item 11 of the agenda under date 2020 be approved, save and accept bylaws 2020-19, 2020-30, 2020-31 and 2020-32. All in favor. Carried. Under agenda item 11.1.2, here on Street Pump Station, a motion by councillors Vizzo Allen and Scott Resolved that the bylaw 2020-19 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of the contract between the city and Avery Construction Limited for the Huron Street Pump Station contract 2019-8E be passed in open council this 20th day of January 2020. All in favor? Under agenda item 11.1.12, official plan amendment 22 McDonald Avenue, a motion by councillors Vizzo Allen and Scott, resolved that bylaw 2020-30 being a bylaw to adopt amendment number 226 to the official plan for the city of Sault Ste. Marie, Joe Ruscio and John Martella, 22 McDonald Avenue, be passed in open council this 20th day of January 2020. All in favor? Carried. Just wait, uh, you're in the affirmative. I did. Okay. I clicked it. Sorry. Well, no, no problem. And then. Under agenda item 11.1.13, zoning 22 McDonald Avenue, a motion by councillors Vizzo Allen and Scott, resolved that bylaw 2020 31 being a bylaw to amend Sault Ste. Marie zoning bylaws 2005 150 and 2005 151 concerning lands located at 22 McDonald Avenue, Joe Ruscio and John Martella, be passed in open council this 20th day of January 2020. All in favor? Under agenda item 11.1.14, development control 22 McDonald Avenue, a motion by councillors Vizzo Allen and Scott, resolved that bylaw 2020-32 being a bylaw to designate the lands located at 22 McDonald Avenue, an area of site plan control Joe Ruscio and John Martella be passed in open council this 20th day of January 2020. All in favor, carried. So this brings us to the closed session yep. motion. Yep. Under agenda item 13, closed session, a motion by councillors Vizu Allen and Scott, resolve that this council proceed into closed session to discuss one matter concerning acquisitions, disposition of land, and further be it resolved that should the said closed session be adjourned, the council may reconvene in closed session to continue to discuss the same matters without the need for a further authorizing resolution. All in favor. And under agenda item 14, a motion by councillors Vizzo Allen and Gardy resolved that this council now adjourn. Now adjourn. Carried.